And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of the great heroes of public interest IP policy, Jamie Love. I was told uh, this is the long arc. I'm supposed to talk about, I said I have 15 minutes. I'm supposed to talk about all these things that have happened. I'm not really going to talk about everything that happened. I'm going to kind of um, just a quick taxonomy kind of of things that have been going on. Um, and I'm sure everybody could improve these taxonomies too, so I don't hold these out as that perfect. Uh, uh, I, I, sometimes I think of reform campaigns as, as uh, either protection of the public domain, uh, consumer protection paradigms, uh, reform of intellectual property rights, or uh, issues to think about new ways of producing community-owned knowledge. And, it, you know, if you look at the battles over the public domain, I, I first got involved in, in <clears throat> 1990 and on about these issues about access to government data and databases, which was, I think, early success in the 90s was one of the really first internet-based successful campaigns on these issues. Um, uh, and there's been continued progress. That's been a real sustainable victory. And it's, it's a little setback from time to time, but I think much more progress all the time. All the open data movement and things like right now is really expanding things. It's, it's really great to watch that. Copyright uh, term it has not been a series of successes for our side um, in Europe or the United States. Um, uh, sui generis database rights, there was this battle over whether or not there would be a treaty that would extend the European model of uh, creating rights and facts and data in databases. And I think it was really important in 1996 that that was really defeated. I'm skipping out all the details of who did everything, because it would yeah, I only have 15 minutes. Um, the WIPO Broadcasting Treaty, I think it was quite important that that be stopped when it was, because it was, it's, it was scheduled to extend a new layer of intellectual property rights uh, onto the internet in unpredictable ways uh, in, in, in this sort of webcasting version. Uh, and then uh, all these fights about what's a uh, patentable invention, of which there are quite a few. Uh, there's been a lot of work in consumer protection things about negotiations or regulation of prices um, or just price negotiations. Uh, disputes over the enforcement of contracts, like, uh, like, like the uh, United States had big battles over this about the uh, business to consumer contracts, the Hague Convention uh, on the enforcement of contracts across borders, that sort of thing. Um, Demands for voluntary licensing or non-assertion of rights in areas where that was important. Um, for intellectual property rights, I mean, this list could be a lot longer. There's, it's complicated. There's a lot of things going on. Um, and then there's this sort of new wave of people talking about how you produce knowledge as a, as a community-owned um, uh, good. And uh, you have the free software movement, really a pioneer uh, in, in a lot of ways for this, the creative commons. Um, all these different vast uh, user-generated content things, which have really been more important than copyright law for a lot of people. Uh, pushing also the idea of what constitutes fair use and things, but certainly just even the originator do documents has been amazing. Um, the new open, the, you know, the growing movement for open courseware. Uh, of course, there's always these issues about how much uh, research the government funds. And there's various uh, delinkage models for incentives, including innovation prizes that invest in R&D as a, a, a medical look. I think this is quite important for us, is can you, can you begin to think of medical uh, uh, R&D as essentially a, uh, becoming a public good on a regular basis, on a sustainable basis, by delinking the cost of R&D from the price of drug completely? And then um, uh, s some work on competitive intermediaries for funding the supply of knowledge as a public good for everything from uh, uh, e-book titles to uh, open sourced uh, research in the medical area. And uh, this proposal uh, for open source dividend. Uh, I'll start though with this slide. This is a slide that shows, uh, uh, the orange shows the percentage of PAC money that far big pharmaceutical companies were giving to Democrats in 2006 and the blue shows the percentage of PAC money that was being given to Democrats in the U.S. Congress in 2010. As you can see, every single company, and that's to me it's kind of an amazing statistic from if you, you know, are a statistics major or something, that every single company 
uh, increased significantly the share of money that was going to Democrats between 2006 to 2007, and most companies end up giving a majority of their money, even if it was a small majority, to Democrats over Republicans. During this period, we lost, I'm sure it's a coincidence, almost all of our friends on Capitol Hill that were helping us on issues involving pharmaceutical drugs. And I, and I think this was pioneered also by the Obama administration, which was really one of the not on that list, but a very big part of that story. So here's some things that we've done recently. I want to talk first about uh, delinking R&D costs from uh, drug price. So our, we have this, this idea that between compulsory licensing and price negotiations and patentability battles and things like that, that it's really difficult uh, to, to maintain the proliferation of new IP types and things like that that are happening in this area. And so we're interested in eliminating monopolies on medicine all the time for all drugs. And in order to move that agenda along, which is a radical agenda, we have to come up with an alternative way of rewarding people that invest private capital in R&D. And we've done that, which is the idea that you use, uh, uh, and there's been a lot of work on the design, and, and Joe Stiglitz and other people also working on this issue, that you design an alternative reward mechanism which doesn't depend upon uh, the price of the drug, but it depends upon the impact of the product on healthcare outcomes and it's done in such a way that the marginal cost to all the, all the relevant actors is zero for extending access to a drug. So this year, uh, as part of uh, Senate Bill 3187 in Section uh, 906, which passed the United States Senate, the Department of Health and Human Services of the United States was asked to uh, enter into agreement with the National Academies to look at whether or not a delinkage scenario of eliminating monopolies and having prizes would work. And they are asked to look at it in three different potential areas. One, all pharmaceutical uh, products and vaccines and biologic drugs and vaccines. Another one would be a smaller way of looking at, which would be just AIDS drugs. And a third one would be in the area of antibiotics. The, the last two are kind of considered the more incremental ways where you can test out the delinkage model. And then in uh, uh, also in the same bill, there was it, it basically a terms of reference of how this, this might be done and, and the kind of things that you would want people to look at. Now, I mention this because the first step in the campaign to get rid of drug monopolies is to get governments and people who pay for drugs to compare the delinkage scenario with the status quo on things like how much money they spend on drugs, how many people have access to the drugs, how it affects healthcare outcomes, and how it affects things like innovation. And this was an example of a, a particular set of terms of reference that came out of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, the HELP Committee, uh, chaired by Senator Harkin, and which did pass the full Senate. It was taken out in the House of Representatives by the Republicans as part of a larger package where they took out a whole range of studies. There are several other a actions right now about delinking medical inventions from the price of drugs. There's uh, several uh, World Health Organization resolutions since around uh, 2008 that refer to this. There's a possible uh, unitate evaluation of delinkages in regards to HIV drugs, just begin kind of the, uh, the, the process of a cost-benefit analysis uh, and consultations. There's the idea of discuss there's discussion of delinking cancer drugs in Europe where you have huge differences in prices uh, in, in incomes between Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and Northern Europe, and where a single price for a cancer drug is a bad thing. Now, uh, uh, ca cancer drug is now being kind of identified by a lot of people as an area to really press on this issue of delinkage, because it's, it's our contention that within Europe and within South America and within the United States and in any, any country I know, you cannot have universal access to cancer drugs without rationing access to the newest drugs unless you pursue a delinkage strategy. So the demand we want groups to say is that if you can find a way other than delinkage to have universal access without rationing to new cancer drugs, show it to us. And if you can't show it to us, you have to at least basically engage on the delinkage debate. I personally uh, 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 can, can respond to this. Uh, you know, it's not completely hypothetical. Uh, uh, my wife right now is uh, is 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 under, under. 
she's in chemotherapy right now, and uh, we're asked right now to pay. I'm sorry, I haven't really talked about this in, a, in an audience before, but she's asked to pay for a drug that cost what our doctor says is around $100,000 a year, and right now she says for the rest of her life. And there's another drug that uh, is possibly useful, recently approved. I asked the doctor about that. She said it's an additional $100,000 a year. She said she wouldn't run it by the insurance. And so then, you know, you have to have a conversation about... <laughs> what, what you do as a family, if... Uh, you know, if your insurance company doesn't really want to basically uh, provide for even, you know, the, the regular drug you need or something like that, because it extends, you know, in an off-label use, which is a common thing, actually, with cancer drugs. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, what, what you do in terms of just your own resources. And that's just not the conversation that you want anyone to have, actually when you're engaged in something like this. A drug my wife takes is, has zero access in developing countries, even though it's considered to be one of the game-changing drugs for cancer, drug, uh, for cancer uh, patients, for at least 20% of cancer patients that have breast cancer. Uh, so uh, uh, there's uh, an effort to sort of ramp it up as far as the issue of cancer drugs, but to ask countries that cannot provide access to cancer drugs for all the patients, including the, 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 most, the most promising drugs that are out there. And by the way, the NIH says that, that uh, over, uh, over uh, half the drugs they consider important were uh, registered with the FDA in 2000. So most, uh, almost all, basically all of those are under patent. And two thirds of the drugs they consider important are still under patent. And then, um, um, uh, but there's other strategies, it's not just this. But the idea is to sort of gauge people in cost-benefit analysis. Then there's, uh, uh, so the strategy is the cost-benefit analysis first, and then focus on this issue of how do you get universal access without rationing to new medicines? And how do you get value for your money out of the R&D? Globally right now, under 8% of what you spend on drugs globally is reported by the drug companies to go into R&D, and about half of that is in research that is most experts would say is medically completely unimportant if not even misstated. So there's other uh, D-linkage initiatives. Um, well, I just talked about these. Some of right, now the open source dividend, this is the way this proposal, it was actually been part of a, a proposal to the WHO involving Chagas disease and tuberculosis innovation. Uh, uh, other, other types of proposals have come out of South America to the WHO as far as reform ideas of funding R&D. But it's also part of this U.S. bill, and it's something the National Academy has been asked to look at. So the idea the National Academy has had is, I'll just explain it for the AIDS bill in the United States. The U.S. proposed that you take AIDS drugs in the United States, that you eliminate the monopoly on AIDS drugs. You're spending close to $10 billion a year right now for AIDS drugs in the United States. You're, you're, you're treating less than 40% of the population that are HIV positive in the United States. We have 1.1 million infected people. We have 50,000 new infections per year. We should be doubling the number of people under treatment to reach treatment for prevention goals since uh, people under drugs have a 95% or something like that uh, lower risk of, of uh, contagion of, of, of passing the disease on. But we have wait lists, we have hidden wait lists, we have all kinds of problems, growing uh, uh, copay, and the new drugs cost like $28,000 for that. Uh, so uh, the idea is that you would, uh, with the open source dividend, with, with, with the bill, was you eliminate the monopolies, replace it with $3 billion a year, and rewards for people to develop things, cash rewards in this sort of delinkage bill. And it would save the government billions of dollars, which we think will come up in the play in the United States is how to solve the budget gap. So this is, this is a reform that actually saves billions of dollars in the United States, which will come in useful as the talks grind on in dealing with the deficit. So, uh, uh, but 5% of the money in the bill, $150 million a year, would not go to the people that develop the new AIDS drugs. They would go to the people who open source technology that was used as an input for the AIDS drug. So that's a lot of money. If you consider the fact that the United States is producing right now, I mean, I mean the whole world right now, the R&D is production is about one new chemical entity per year for the last 25 years. $150 million, that's for people that write articles, open access to laboratories, share technologies, have open royalty-free licenses on their patents. It means every university and small companies and people like that that think they have some compound that may have some or some insight or technology that might help in the AIDS research has a 
big time economic incentive to open source their technology so they can participate in the open source development. So it creates an economic incentive uh, to stimulate people to share, which we value as society but don't reward economically right now. The R&D treaty negotiations, we're lucky to have uh, Herman Velasquez, who was a negotiator for uh, Bolivia in the last negotiation we'll talk uh, on this panel about. I will just say we had a big setback in November. <laughs> the week I was there, uh, the World Health Organization fired every one of the employees of its tropical disease program, all 60 employees. They'd been 100 employees uh, two years ago. They were down to 60. The week I was there, they fired everyone, and they promised to hire back half of them. So the staff will go from 200 to 30 in two years. At the very same meeting, the director general of the WHO was beating the brains out of delegates to kill a proposal for an R&D treaty that would fund more research in this area. And you have to ask why she's doing it. Well, her biggest funder for discretionary programs is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The second biggest funder is the United States government. Both of those entities were bound and determined to, to, to kill, kill, that drug, kill that proposal. I think the problem is, and other people speculate, when you make R&D the focus of a trade negotiation, it, it, it competes with IPR as a, as a focus of a, a trade negotiation. Because having longer and longer patents, more and more patents, higher and higher drug prices, and more sui generis regimes on medical technology competes with the ask that people just plainly pay money to put up money to pay for medical research. And even though the amount of money was relatively modest in this proposal, the, the proposal was widely considered to be provocative enough and important enough that the, there was this mobilization by a lot of different companies to shut it down and try to, it's not dead, but it did suffer a, a setback. Uh, the Wellcome Trust issued a statement against the linkage against the R&D treaty, which just really astounded people. I want to just mention that. The Gates Foundation plays a very important role in uh, global IPR policy. Uh, it does much good work, but it also, sometimes working with Microsoft, has been a major player in global IPR negotiations since 1999. Uh, they have an interest in patent policies for medicine and biotechnology, agriculture products, former Gates Foundation, um, or funded officials now hold key positions at DHS, uh, USAID, the Department of Commerce, et cetera, and several UN agencies. Um, the Gates Foundation has great influence right now on WHO, WIPO, Global Fund, Unitaid. It's the largest, as I mentioned, the largest discretionary budget uh, donor to the WHO. No individual has this much, as Bill Gates does, no individual has this much power in global uh, health policy ever. And it's, uh, it's the elephant in the room, and if people are not talking about what the Gates Foundation is doing in this area, uh, they're not really talking about uh, uh, really who the most important actors are. Also, the Gates Foundation is funding a large percentage of the, all the global health journalists. Uh, the, the Guardian page is co-branded now with the Gates Foundation. They're funding uh, $25 million of the last grant, I think, or 35 or something, the BBC. They fund the NewsHour. The NPR, they fund work at commercial things like Viacom and ABC News. Uh, they're all over the place. And, uh, and when he talked to a journalist, we were going to do a story about this once. He went back, he talked to his editor. This is the Washington Monthly. The, and the editor said, it really sounds like a great story, but I have to tell you, we have a grant proposal into the Gates Foundation. It would fund two positions on our staff. Can we just put this on the back burner? So I'm just telling you, you have no idea how profoundly that's affected the lack of reporting on these disputes on this right now, because nobody wants, they want to report about the great job philanthropy's doing, that's what they're paid to do, and that's exactly, they've been turned into flax for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, even ProPublica is funded by these guys now, uh, by the Gates Foundation. Medicine's patent pool, I want to zip through this, because it was discussed earlier. Um, the strategy of the Medicine's patent pool was to ask for pro-competitive licenses, if acceptable license available, focus on the country's products and companies, that do not have pro-competitive com licenses available. I've worked in compulsory licensing cases, a lot of them establishing you've had a bona fide offer to license uh, rejected is often a precondition of getting a compulsory license, if not legally, uh, politically often. Uh, the MPA license, MPP licenses uh, makes it easier to get compulsory licenses. Challenges to obtaining competitive supplies of drugs in 150 developing countries and more than a dozen HIV products is really enormous. Voluntary licenses are part of a larger set of strategy. No single strategy works for all countries and all products. And I think a criticism of voluntary licensing efforts by the patent pool should address the feasibility of alternatives when you're talking about 150 countries and over a dozen products. 
Uh, the wipe of negotiations from copyright and limitations. I think this is toward the end here. Um, Monday, there's going to be a, a, supposed to be a vote, a, an extraordinary session of the uh, General Assembly, the World Intellectual Property Organization, whether to convene a diplomatic conference on a treaty for people with uh, print disabilities. This will be the first time, if it goes that direction, and it may or may not, but if it goes down that direction, there will be a treaty that, that, that is really focusing explicitly on the rights of uh, a consumer population or a human rights population. It's super controversial. Uh, the only thing I think you could point to before this was probably the, the uh, in the copyright area would be the 1967 and 1971 negotiations on a developing country only instrument at WIPO, uh, which ended up with a bad outcome in 1971. Um, uh, there's a lot of artillery thrown at this, and there's a lot of other, uh, uh, as people here coming up behind this. This is Chris Friend. He's been leading the uh, delegation for the World Blind Union. Um, uh, Normita is a lawyer from, uh, uh, works with CIS in uh, India, has done a, uh, done a great job in the past in working on this negotiation. She was, she'd come to the WIPO sessions and she'd go out, she's blind and she would jog and fall down occasionally because she couldn't see stuff. A very brave woman. Uh, when she talked there, she said the way that she learned how to read was she had her father read, read, read textbooks to her. That's how she got through law school. Um, Pablo Lacuna runs uh, one of the, uh, he runs probably the big, most, one of the most important uh, libraries for the blind out of Argentina. Uh, he's right now really not able to share his collections with people in Paraguay or Uruguay or other Latin American countries. He wants to fix this. He's been really a heart and soul of the Latin American negotiations. Ellie, I can't say her last name. Uh, uh, she's from Kenya. She's been one, is one of the many people that showed up in the delegations that really uh, emotionally move the delegates. So we've done fairly good with the people in the room that, that spend a week with blind people, helping them find the bathroom or cross the street. We don't do so good with the people that don't show up back in you know, the home offices that are just talking to a publisher, a lobbyist. Um, this is my last slide, pretty sure. Um, we're, uh, we're, uh, this is our new, a new initiative. It's, it's, not, it's not so new, but it's, it hasn't gone very far. It makes it sound kind of new. Uh, the World Trade Organization has a schedule for the supply, I mean, for, for, for trade in goods and services, and it works as follows. You make an offer to essentially privatize some part of your economy and make it uh, access to foreign companies available, like saying you'll allow foreign countries to invest in your broadcast television stations or privatize your daycare centers or something like that. And once you make the offer, which is completely voluntary, it becomes binding. So it's a voluntary, then binding paradigm. And there's sui generis offers. It's not like everyone does it. Each country kind of decides for itself what they want to offer. You may ask why anyone offers something because you're subject to dispute resolution at WTO if you don't do it. But it's because somebody, you think somebody might want you to do it or you, you know, it becomes part of a, an overall thing where you're trading against all kinds of other things in the negotiation. Well, we propose that they have a schedule on the supply of public goods. So once a country makes an offer to supply something, that it becomes binding once the offer is made in that forum and on that schedule. It allows you to create mini R&D treaties or mini public good treaties without having to create a treaty or create a governing body or anything because you basically trade off in the fact that you have an existing institution with the best enforcement system on the planet Earth, which is a WTO, and you put that muscle behind public goods in the same way it is behind private goods. That's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>